Welcome everybody. It's always nice to uh, to be at um, at DTU. Yeah, for the past couple of years, I have worked with a very funny, weird organization with uh, NATO, and uh, I guess this is what has given me uh, the idea of uh, tonight's talk because there are some really interesting lessons to be learned about making strategy happen from the military. Okay, you might. Uh, think that after Afghanistan, after this disaster, what on earth is there to be learned from, <laughs> from the military? And in a certain way, you can swap it around. Because we can say the way how Afghanistan was, was handled is actually, it, it, it exemplifies how it should not be done. But somewhere inside military organizations, especially, uh, especially with elite commandos, there's a very different approach to strategic thinking, strategic planning, <coughs> strategy execution, and there's actually a way to combine all of those together. And uh, by the end of the session, you will understand that this is actually not even new thinking. This thinking is about 200 years old. So we're going to go a little bit back into, into history. We're going to step a little bit away from a business context for some time. But then in about half an hour or so, we bring it right back into the world of business. And then there's a challenge for you. Because uh, as Matt and, and Stefan and all the others have said, this is a pretty much hands-on place. So don't expect me or don't expect anybody here at DTU to talk at you for, for long periods of time. Um, knowledge is created, understanding is increased by, through dialogue, by working together, through challenging each other. That's how we uh, move forward and that's in a nutshell what we're trying to do a little bit tonight. So it starts with the... Uh, sad observation that execution is a challenge for many organizations. And I'm pretty confident if you think about your own organizations, can you say with confidence, with conviction, no, we are excellent at execution? I don't think so. Most people, most organizations struggle with that. It doesn't always have to go to this extent of disaster, but something often goes wrong. And I believe we can try to understand what goes wrong by looking at the relationship between actions, what we do, plans, what we want to do and what we plan to achieve, and the actual outcomes. So when execution goes wrong, there's first an alignment gap. And that alignment gap is quite simply that People don't do what we expect them to do. That's not the only gap. Then there's also a knowledge gap. The knowledge gap is that the plans are actually not optimal because our understanding of the complexity of the reality is insufficient. And then there's the effects gap between what we think the effect our actions will have and what the real outcome is there is another gap. So how do we deal typically with these gaps? With more control, more detailed instruction so that nobody can veer off script and more detailed information. But thereby, we are confusing outcomes with measures. KPI is not an outcome. It's not what we want to achieve. We're confusing understanding, real understanding with information. Just adding more layers of information, just adding more layers of detail does not equal deeper understanding. And we're confusing clarity with detail. More detailed instructions are richer, yes, but that doesn't make them necessarily clear enough. Clear instructions do not always have to be very detailed. So that's what leads us right to the heart of of the problem. There's some myth associated, some wrong beliefs associated with execution. Number one, execution equals alignment. Well, in theory, perhaps, yes. In practice, in reality, the way our organizations are structured, nobody, no manager has everything under control. You have to work across cross-functional lines, across reporting lines in the organization. You have to bring others on board. You have to bring some units um, to life in the first place. Execution means sticking to the plan. No, of course not. 
Um, the military has been saying for over 200 years that what typically happens is as soon as a strategy or a battle plan uh, hits the battlefield, the plan goes out of the window. So why should it be different in organizations? But then sticking to the plan that is essentially driving straight into the wall when the road that you should be taking leads somewhere else. Communication equals understanding. Yes, communication is immensely important. And we know from experience and from experiments that effective managers communicate essentially all day long. But this is not only about the frequency. It has to be clear communication. So here we're back with the clarity. Often I find in working with many organizations that even senior executives are confused about their strategic objectives, how they relate to each other, how to prioritize between them. And actually at the end of the session, we're going to do a small little exercise precisely around that. A performance culture drives execution. <laughs> Well, a performance culture is a culture where there are rewards, but these rewards essentially are backwards looking. You measure what has happened and you reward it. But how do these rewards or how do, does this culture um, cover or encourages forward looking performance, adjustments, agility, learning, openness to learning? Again, there is a gap here. Execution should be driven from the top. Well, it has to be reinforced from the top, but we must never forget that top leaders are far too removed from the heat of the action in order to be able to recognize when it is important to stick to the plan and when also it is important to change the plan. So we need a, a better approach, otherwise we're not getting out of that. You will recognize many of these through your own experience. The key obstacles to execution are typically um, people-related, meaning the inability to manage effectively, to overcome internal resistance, power structures in the organization, unclear communication, or the strategy from the beginning was too vague, not clearly defined. Lack of ownership or lack of understanding of the execution plans across the organization. So how do we get out of that? We will get out of that by going into history. We're going to the hour, the day, when a new, a better concept of thinking about strategy and execution was invented. And that was in 1806, 14th October, 1806. That day, which saw two battles engaging the French troops and Prussian and Allied troops at Jena and Auerstedt. And it was a massive victory for Napoleon and a massive defeat for the Prussian troops. On the battlefield, they were just no match for the French. The French army at that time, they were conscripts. There was still the belief in the ideals of the French Revolution. In terms of Douglas MacGregor's uh, theory of motivation, this is clearly implicit motivation. They, I wouldn't go so far to say they were enjoying what they were doing, but they knew what they were doing and why they were there. On the other side, the Prussian army had been very effective 15, 60, 70 years earlier under Frederick the Great. It was a well-drilled, well-oiled war machine. And it hadn't changed for 60, 70, 80 years. People were no conscripts. They were not made felt empowered. They didn't really know why they were there. They were waiting for orders. But on that day, on the battlefield, the orders didn't come. And this is what decided the outcome. For Prussia, this was a disaster because in the Treaty of Tilsit that settled peace in Europe at that time, at least for a couple of years, Prussia lost about half of its territory. Absolute disaster. But luckily for them, there were a couple of 
quite young, quite ambitious staff officers, like Clausewitz, who went on this fantastic treaty on strategy on war. Like Neisenau, like Scharnhorst, they started not only to reform the Prussian army, they actually reformed the wider country, the Prussian state, because Prussia was a military society. So the reforms of the army were then also reflected in wider society, and this then enabled also the, then, the new emerging Germany after 1870, 1871 to take shape and to become quite a performing country. So these deep-seated reforms, they challenged the traditional notion of leadership and representing it, uh, replacing it with a more modern strategy-oriented concept. At the heart of that reform was one man, Moltke the Elder. Like many uh, German officers, Prussian officers, he was of aristocratic origin, but he was very young when he came into high office, and he was very smart. He had a vision that few others had in the Prussian army or in other armies at that time. He essentially understood that the worst thing on a battlefield is not to take the wrong decision. The worst thing that you can do is not to take a decision, is inactivity. Because through inactivity, the opportunities get wasted and the threats get only more challenging. So in that sense, the worst decision is a decision that is not taken. And that was precisely the problem of the Prussian army in 1806. Decisions were not taken because people, officers, were waiting for orders. And I believe in many organizations, it's exactly the same. So von Molke challenged that. He replaced it with a new concept, which is contained in his uh, small treaty, Instructions for Senior Unit Commanders. You would not expect to find great leadership philosophy in, in, such, a, uh, in, in, in such a work with such a name. But it makes a lot of sense and... It goes completely against what was widespread conviction in the army then and in many armies still today. For an officer to wait for orders at times when none can be given would be quite absurd. The higher the level of command, the shorter and more general the order should be. Meaning, the higher you are in the hierarchy, the less detail you should apply in your instructions, in your guidance. It is vital that subordinates fully understand the purpose of the order. Because when they fully understand the purpose of the order, then they are in a position to change its implementation, to stop its implementation, to replace it with something that is commanded by the change in the circumstances in the environment. We need people to adjust, whether on the battlefield or in our organizations. We need them to adjust to a changing environment, particularly these days where environments are so complex, ambiguous, and seem to constantly shift from one side to the other. But how can you expect people to adjust if they don't understand what the actual purpose is, what should actually be achieved. So these were the uh, convictions that uh, Moltke built into a new leadership philosophy in the Prussian army. And uh, this philosophy lasted up to the First World War and the German army, even Second World War. And after the Second World War, something interesting happened. There was an American military historian that, uh, that was a time of the data crunching, that looked into data, tried to perform and to, to um, identify the performance comparatively between German officers and Allied officers. And uh, to his surprise, he came to the conclusion that if you compared them one on a one-by-one -one basis, the German officers were superior in their performance to the um, Allied officers because the Allied officers were still pretty much old school. So for a German officer, 
and he had been given the order to take that hill and there was something getting in his way where he would take a step back and thinking, why do I actually have to take that hill? What do I want to achieve with that? And if you have that understanding, then you realize there is a way around that hill. You do not have to send your people up there to get mowed down by um, enemy machine gun positions. But that is only possible if you understand the purpose. Whereas American, British, or French officers who were not trained in that way, who did not share that um, philosophy, they were pretty much old school military. You give them an order, they do it. So they were sending up their people to be killed because they did not themselves understand the bigger picture. So that American military historian was so fascinated by what he found that he dug deeper in, he um, uncovered the, the text of uh, von Moltke and the underlying principle, and slowly over the years, it found its way uh, into NATO, now it is official NATO doctrine, and it is called mission command. So the idea is to not give detailed orders or instructions to officers. What you give them is the purpose, what is to be achieved and why, but the how you leave it to them. How is that possible? They cannot um, accept actions that could go 360 degrees. Of course, there are boundaries. You set them boundaries. It gives them a framework within which they can operate. But what they choose to do inside this framework, that is entirely up to them. While this is not rolled out across broad army units, it is the basic operating model of elite commandos in the US, in the UK, and in other countries, whether it's US Marines, Royal Marines, Navy SEALs, SAS, etc. They all operate based on this approach of mission command, which reconciles strategic thinking and strategic acting. So this is really where formulation of strategy and execution of strategy, including improvisation, come together. So they reject this false choice between do we go for alignment, everybody down the same side, in the same direction, or do we give people autonomy? What von Moltke had seen, and that is in, what is encompassed in mission command, is that actually what you want to have is that. You want to have a maximum autonomy which is enabled by alignment. So these two, we must not think of them as being opposite. They actually enable each other. So if we go back to the, the three gaps that we had, um, the alignment gap, where typically an organization will look for more detailed instruction, in mission command, you communicate to every unit as much of the higher intent as is necessary to achieve the purpose. You don't overload them with instructions, what they should do, but you give them enough to understand the higher level objectives. What is your unit trying to achieve? What is the division trying to achieve? What are we overall trying to achieve here? Instead of um, giving them more detailed information or building more detailed information into plans, so dealing with the knowledge gap, it is not commanding more than is absolutely necessary or only for the circumstances that you can directly foresee. So you don't go into step two, three, four, five. If you can plan through the first step properly, that might actually already be good enough, and that might be the only thing that you can do. And for the effects gap, instead of um, going for more control, everyone retains freedom of decision and action within bounds, meaning within boundaries. So, allowing each, each level um, of the command to define how they will achieve the intent of the next level up, limit direction to defining and communicating intent, and giving individuals freedom to adjust within the framework. So how does this look like in, in, in these units? And uh, I take the example of uh, the uh, UK Royal Marines. They go for every operation with <coughs> these 
six well-defined steps. Context, higher intent, objective purpose, control measures, implied task, and boundaries. Context, what is the situation? Higher intent is not about what you want to achieve or what you have to achieve. It is what the larger organization behind you, one or two levels higher, is trying to achieve. Then, your objective, what needs to be achieved, and why the purpose of making clear how it fits into the bigger picture. Control measures, how do you assess your progress, how do you know that you're getting somewhere where you want to be. Implied task, what looks like a critical action, a critical factor in order to um, achieve the objective, and what are your boundaries? How far can you go, up to where can you go in making your decisions in adjusting to action without having to consult your senior leadership? And also then, where is the point where you need to know you need to consult with others because you're getting into their area of operation and that's where coordination is necessary. Now, this might sound very much military-like. Um, in an organization, this is how it could look like. So here you're looking at a mature IT services company. We're having the same six steps. So a company has a problem. The market share is eroding. The loss of share must be halted. Customer service is key to halting this decline. And with the current loss of accounts, every day that passes makes recovery more difficult. This is setting the context for the leadership of um, this IT services company, which is part of a broader organization. Higher intent, two levels higher up. We have corporate, two levels higher up, and we have the technology group or the technology division of which this IT services company is a component. Two levels higher up. We want to transform the company within the next three years. Why? Why is that important? Because we want to deliver superior service and financial performance. One level higher up technology group, what needs to be achieved? We want to develop and support a coherent product line that is easy to service. Why is that important? Because in order to allow sales and marketing to grow um, their revenues, only when the context is set and the higher intent is clear, then we can focus on the objective and the purpose behind for this IT services company. So, objective is to accelerate delivery of critical products to market. Why? Well, we need to enable sales channels to halt the market share erosion by year end. What are the control measures? And deliver a certain number of uh, product uh, and <coughs> are set by year end and on budget. See that the total market share in Asia at the end of the year equals a share at the beginning of the year. So these are measures that broadly look into different perspectives, tell you that if you can achieve them, you are going to where you want to go. Imply task, what is critical here, most of all, accelerate the development of the products that you want to put on the market. Boundaries. Well, product quality, this has to be defined in reference to customer needs and the service organization. <coughs> So you cannot decide, although you have a lot of freedom, you cannot decide to do whatever you want. You have to respect product quality requirements from a customer perspective and from the services perspective. Product cost here, there are budget and competitive benchmarks. Those have to be achieved. Another key requirement is to reduce the number of development centers. This has to be agreed with the head of Asia and so on. So four or five clear boundaries that the division that the services company must not overstep. Here they have to stop and coordinate with others. But as long as they stay within the boundaries, how they achieve their objective is entirely up to them. Neither corporate nor the technology group will tell them what to do. So this is how mission command can be transposed um, to the level of an organization. And if you can do that, then you have immediately the clarity and alignment that is missing so often 
when execution falters. You increase the speed and the effectiveness. Employees, you will see, they start to use the Freedom Tech Initiative and thereby you actually combine top-down and bottom-up planning. Because the broad objectives, they are still decided by corporate. But corporate doesn't have the information that people on the ground have. That's why the operational plans have to be made by those who are there to deliver the strategy. So in that sense, a good mission plan, it's, it's almost like a movie script. No script is so detailed that it directs each actor or actress to say exactly the same thing or in exactly the same way. That's the art of acting. It's, it's interpretation. That's the art of a director. You take the script, but you bring it to life in the way that you feel is best or that plays to the particular strength of the actor or actress. Um, this approach also has been written a lot about by one of my colleagues, Stephen Bungay. He's a British military historian, Oxford-educated, Boston Consulting Group, and uh, he has written a series of fascinating books on, on, on the Second World War, trying to do some data mining, number crunching on the Battle of Britain or the Battle of Al Alamein, and distilling the leadership and strategy lessons from, from that. Now, what is key to this approach? If you want to bring this to life in your organization, this really requires clarity of your objectives. If at the higher level you are not clear what needs to be achieved, there is no way for people further down the line to use the authority, to use the freedom that you give them. Because what direction should they go? They need the guidance provided and provided only by the higher level objective. So that's where the clarity becomes so important. And uh, that's where you know, we need to test how good are we in providing this clarity. So what I'm talking about is uh, seeing the relationships between corporate objectives. Understanding what really is the top one, what really is the number one objective that we need to follow. And then, how does this number one objective needs to be broken down, needs to be made meaningful for people further down? So in that sense, what I'm looking for from you in a moment is a strategy translation tree that sorts through a short set of 13 corporate objectives. So this goes back to a workshop that I did with a colleague um, about 10, 11 years ago with a British construction company. They were struggling with precisely that, sorting through their objectives. So um, in a working dinner, after dinner, we helped them in a workshop that ran until midnight. We had over, or they had over 20 objectives. To make it easier, I reduced the list here to 13. That, that shouldn't be too complicated. Sorting 13 objectives. Now, we are at a technical university, I know that. But you have in, in front of you some very old style technology. <laughs> Meaning you have a notepad, you have some paper, and you have a pen. What I want you to do, what I invite you to do, is to turn to your neighbor, Look at these 13 objectives, which are put in no particular order. It doesn't mean that number one is the most important one. No, no, I didn't want to go that far in helping you. Find the one that you think is the most important. And then, how does the tree build up, or rather build down? How does it come down from the higher level objective? So, please do this exercise together with your neighbor, and let's make this competitive Meaning, once when we um, reveal the solution, if you get the top one right, this is three points. If you get the second one right, this is two points. And for all the others in the right boxes, you'll get one point. And uh, the sharp mathematicians among you will have noticed this adds up to 16. So 
if later when we reveal it, I ask how many points have you scored, somebody says 17, 18, I know you have, loose, you have used far too much freedom there. <laughs> okay, please give it a go. Let's see how long this takes. I think probably, let's try to run this until, until six. Six minutes. <laughs> 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 Vi prøver at vælge noget, som vi kan lide, der er højere for at lære i virkeligheden. Det er en Det er det, jeg har lyst til at sige. Det er det, jeg har lyst til at sige. Det er det, jeg har lyst til at sige. Det er det, jeg har lyst til at sige. Det er det, jeg har lyst til at sige. Det er det, jeg har lyst til at s
Yeah, 
One more minute. Ja, det er All right, shall we stop there? Otherwise, I'm afraid the break time is never going to come. Yesterday, 
part of Yesterday it. at around at the same time I was still in a small mountain resort, remote area in Switzerland, and I was with a group of insurance um, executives. I gave them this exercise, there were twenty-five of them, and after twenty-five minutes that they still hadn't completely solved it. There were only two who were able to sort of cover the first lines. So don't feel bad if um, you struggled with that. It looks so easy on paper, but once when you get into trying to understand the enabling or reinforcing relationships between objectives, then it is really tricky. So um, I'm going to just going to ask, um, number one, what should we put there? Anybody being brave and wanting to volunteer something? Number yes. one, which is? Yes. Number one is number yeah. one? Number one, yeah. Yes. Number one to number one. Okay? Yeah, number one. Number one. Anybody else who says, um, number one's number one? No. <laughs> okay, anybody for suggesting another number? Uh, I think, I mean, from financial uh, side, I think it's number six. I mean, all business is about to making money. Mm -hmm. Okay. Number six. More fans for number six? No. Yeah, some. Something else. Give us something else. Number four. Number four. <laughs> Grow market share by three percentage points. Okay. I would say number eight. Yeah. yeah. Eight. Eight. Why number eight? Because I guess that would be the the why, the purpose of it. Then we can find out how can we uh, recover our gross momentum and then break it down. Exactly. You're spot on. On the right at the top is number eight. That's the overarching purpose. Yes, it's business is about numbers, making numbers. But that's where the numbers are. You, if you read it carefully, we want to recover our growth momentum. So you're looking at a company that must have been growing in the past. So growth has stalled. It has come to a stop. And what happens is that shareholders get first disappointed and then very angry. And when they get angry, you better do something to show them that they should not be angry with you. So recovering the growth momentum, showing that we can grow as a company, not for the next 12 months, but consistently putting the growth engine to, to work again, that is the overriding objective. And then I can see a very nice objective just below that to provide some sort of guidance or progress measure whether we've achieved that before we go to the, to the Y. And you're right, the Y plays a lot of role, um, a big role here. The objective that goes just below is growing the top line by 18% over two years. So if, that's the, if recovering our growth momentum, that's the overall overriding objective. Here we have a control measure. Here we have something to work towards to know, yes, if we over the next two years, we can grow top line by 18%, then we can stand in front of our investors and say with conviction, hey, you see, we're getting there. The growth engine is turning again. And then it unfolds quite easily. There are four sub-objectives that directly contribute to um, growth. Sustain the above inflation improvement in revenue per customer. If we can do that, top line will grow. Growing market share by three percentage points, unless you are in a shrinking market. Well, you shouldn't be anyway. Then. If you're in a stable or growing market and you grow your market share by 3%, um, it is almost uh, uh, inevitable that your revenues are going to grow. Enter new markets beyond our core, grow new products in key markets. How do we get more revenue per customer? Well, we sell more of our existing products to current customers. How do we do that? Well, by developing better intelligence about competitors. Become an innovative company. Um, it's a nice objective, but it's an objective that feeds into another one. If uh, as a CEO or CFO, you stand, uh, stand in front of your angry investors who are disappointed with your lack of growth and say, we want to become an innovative company. It's fine, that sounds nice, but what about growth? How is this <laughs> translating into... Okay, yeah, because... You do not necessarily have to become an innovative company in order to grow. 
So becoming an innovative company is important, is an enabling factor to grow new products in key markets and to enter new markets beyond our core. And how do we become an innovative company? By strengthening our innovation culture, for example. And how do we strengthen our innovation culture? By recruiting people with the right mindset and by um, shortening the time for decision-making and approval. So a moment of truth. Have you added up your scores? Any, anybody, anybody having any scores to, to offer in civic confidence? Somebody in more than five? Oh, seven. Five. <laughs> How much? Seven. Seven. Good. Anybody saying more than seven? Eight? Eight here. Eight. Oh, wow. More than eight. Anybody? More than eight? Okay, then I think the eight wins the day today, closely followed by the seven. Yeah. Now, how is this important, or why is this important? Let me explain to you why. Assume we are in a large organization. We are exactly in this, sort, in this sort of organization. And they need to switch the growth engine on again. It's a large organization, meaning many managers, many different departments. So 10 o'clock in the morning, an email pops up on the screen of a manager working in a particular department. Email is from headquarter. Email says, new important project for you in your department. Go through all your processes, streamline them, and make sure that you shorten the time for decision-making and approval in your part of the operation. The manager looks at that, scratching his head, said, I really didn't need this right now. I've already so much to deal with. What are these guys thinking? And he calls his uh, or her employee. Employee comes, Tom. Tom comes and manager says to Tom, look, Tom, this came just out. Um, the deadline is in three weeks. So for the next three weeks, you probably you have to stop whatever you were doing and you have to take on this task. And Tom asked the boss, boss, what you know how much useful things I'm, I'm working on. So what's the point of that? And the boss now is, that's the critical moment. That's a really critical moment. The boss looks at Tom says, Tom, are you stupid? It comes from headquarters. You know these guys. Can you believe it? They're paid money for that. You know, they easily get frustrated and angry, and we need to be on good books with them, so just, just, just do something. And Tom says, oh, whatever, it goes away. So what do you think is the result of what is going to be delivered three <coughs> weeks later? The problem is that this is not only one department. That same story might happen 100 times that same day between managers who receive exactly the same email and their employees. So what are then the chances of that company to become more innovative, which we just identified as a key driver for meeting their targets? The chances are very low. So that's why we need to rewind Going back to the moment where Tom asked the boss, boss, why? And the boss said, wait a minute. I know you have a lot to do, but you need to understand that if you can do that and if you can find ways how we become much faster in moving forward, in making decisions and in approving um, our projects, then we strengthen our innovation culture. And you can already see some. So, innovation, what, what, why? Because, Tom, we need to become an innovative company. Well, why have they decided that we need to become an innovative company? Because we want to enter new markets beyond our core and grow new products in key markets. Don't you think, Tom, that becoming more innovative would help with that? Yeah, probably. But, but why do we need to do those things, enter new markets beyond our core and grow new products in key markets? We need to do that because... We have the new target to grow the top line by 18% over two years. And why is that so important suddenly? Because you know very well, Tom, that we have stopped growing as a company. There are important stakeholders and shareholders who are not that um, happy with us. They want to see us recover our growth momentum. So if we can show them an 18% increase over two years, we can show them evidence that we are on the right track. 
Does it make sense to you, Tom? So Tom still has a little bit of doubt in his face, but uh, he starts to see the point in what he's doing. Out the way. Comes back three weeks later with the results. Do you think they are making progress towards becoming an innovative company? I think so. If that news story happens 100 times the same day, that company is indeed moving forward in the right direction. Um, did this cost any money for the boss? No. The only thing that it cost him is taking two minutes, three minutes, sitting down with Tom and making sure Tom gets the bigger picture. He sees the higher intent. He understands the context, just like in Mission Command. That's the context. Our investors are screaming for growth. Um, he understands the two, three layers of objectives beyond um, his own objective. He's given the task what to achieve, but how exactly he's going to do that, where he's going to define the time savings, the process streamlining, what the solution is going to look like, that is up to Tom to find. It's not an easy task, but here now we have the chance of Tom being actually motivated to do it because he sees meaning in it. And we know from psychology that nothing is as powerful or as motivational than finding meaning in the work that we are doing. And that's what we're providing here to Tom. So that's the, uh, the power of uh, mission planning. He was a big fan of that. Um, he wrote in one of his books uh, precisely about uh, Moltke that for them, for the Prussian strategy, was not a lengthy action plan. It was the evolution of a central idea through continuously changing circumstances. I quite like that. A central idea, one big purpose, one thing you really want to achieve. And this is what you stick to. But it moves through changing phases, changing environments, changing circumstances. But as long as there's clarity about the purpose, about the what and about the why, then people have the freedom and can take the freedom to see through um, and make sure that we still keep this big purpose in mind. Right. This is where my little talk, uh, class, um, interaction, whatever you want to call it, stops. I hope you, you found that useful. Try it out with, with your people at work. I can guarantee you, if you have the clarity for yourself, and as I said earlier in, in, in my presentation, I've seen many managers who already struggle with that, figuring out how does it all fit together. But if, if you don't see it, that there's no chance in this world that the people below you are going to see it. So if you can figure it out for yourself and bring it to life for others, it might change a lot in terms of your organization's uh, capability to execute. Any questions? Yes. Um. May the profile of the business or the nature of the business of the company uh, has impact on the prioritizing you know, the points, the items on the, on the bigger plan, uh, in your mm -hmm. opinion? Um, you mean specifically yeah. to the list that the I result. showed? This is the absolute and the one absolutely different from company to company. Um, if you are a, a money-driven business, like most businesses are, and, and you are responsible to shareholders, then probably 99 out of 100 companies would also put the, the number eight at the top. Otherwise, if the leaders didn't do that, they would not last very long. Yes, please. Just one question. I, of course, uh, agree with your exercise that prioritize and growth did also end up on top up here. But then, as, we, as I was thinking, if a company has a history of having lost its growth momentum, what would typically be happening is that the decision processes at the top level are getting slow. Um, and that decisions lower in the hierarchy is really not what is, what is uh, slowing down the complete company. In this case, you break down that the decision making is going down to a lower level in the organization. So I would guess Tom would say, you know exactly what happens when we come up with proposals. It's, it's 
getting slowed down further up in the organization. So I don't know if you have. have a yeah, yeah. I think I, I think I understand what 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 you what you're trying to say. Um, von Moltke would say that uh, essentially then the, the top level, they, they are not doing their job if, if that happens because then they're putting too many constraints, too many boundaries um, ar around that. So here we're looking at an organization and having worked with the leaders, I can tell you they, they are aware of that and it's, it's not necessarily them the problem. It is people further on that did not feel empowered. They could not feel empowered because they, had, they have no understanding. If you don't see how what you are doing in your part influences other parts and wider objectives, then they couldn't see it. But in, in general, you're right. And then this is always uh, the, the first or knee-jerk reaction for, for many leaders in organizations to say for the leadership team, is, oh, we need change, but uh, not us. It's the rest of the organization that needs change. We are the change. So with us, nothing is wrong. It's with them down there. They, they don't understand it. So if that system gets implemented on a large scale, there is no way then anymore for senior leaders to say, um, we are fine and, and they are not, because then the decisions are effectively decentralized. Yes? Uh, thank you, first of all, to your presentation. Uh, with all my respect to NATO and uh, also what you mentioned about Napoleon, this concept of mission command based on military mentality. I was missing to see in this presentation what is the disadvantages of the mission command, because you mentioned the strengths of that and the advantages, but the, the disadvantage, because there is, there is somehow when you give the objective to achieve and why, you are disregarding somehow the ethical uh, perspective. We need somehow to also do discussions and to create with the entire organization, uh, family, the objectives. And this is, this is missing because when you put the objective alone as a leader, you are disregarding totally the evaluation, the discussion of the objective itself. Let's say the NATO, it could be the objective mm -hmm. is coming from an unethical background or a political side, which mm -hmm. is it's totally, totally not, mm -hmm. not on the right track. So people are implementing where it's, it's, it's a very, uh, very uh, bad goal. Yeah, yeah. In this context, yeah. I, I think I see what um, what you want to say. Um, a couple of things to that. First thing is, um, NATO as an organization doesn't function with mission command. It cannot. NATO works with consensus. It's twenty nine nations, and uh, my institution has a contract with NATO. If I want to change this contract, it would take probably four years because every single one of the partners needs to agree. The fascinating thing about NATO is if you see them from the inside, it's an institution that almost cannot function due to that consensus. And they don't seem to get anything done. And then Putin enters uh, Ukraine, and it's a situation of crisis, and then within 12 hours, they mobilize everybody in the same direction, and suddenly uh, consensus is there, um, established through the realities where, where there wasn't before. So it's a ver very weird organization that seems to exist or work well only in crisis mode. In, in normal times, NATO <laughs> doesn't work. And perhaps I'm pushing the, uh, my case a little bit too far, but it's, it's a weird case. But also what I would like to say is, um, you're right, um, mission command does not ensure that the objective made at the top is ethical but then no, no system does. The, the traditional um, hierarchy-based system, it, it doesn't do it either. So we, we are not uh, solving with this the choice of the overall or the legitimacy or legitimacy of the overall objective. What we are solving with this problem is the, the effectiveness of the um, execution and uh, realization of the objective. But it's, it's, it's a fair point, yes. Yeah. I think it's a very good exercise what we have been seeing here. Actually, we did a trio. We have been discussing the priority of these points. Um, but we, 
we didn't we don't have enough information about the specific organization or the company to determine what points should be upper and the hierarchy or what points should be further down so of course we are coming from different background we agreed on different things but it's very interesting to see <coughs> that we could have different views on how things should move if it's a company very wealthy organization maybe then the, their innovation should come number one to be innovative at, at the point where another company where the uh, the money making it's the priority then we should move to another thing so very interesting exercise of course but uh, we need we need more information, more information. Like, come back true. tomorrow with yeah. the mba yeah. classes so <laughs> there's plenty of cases with a lot of information you, you will have more than than, than you want but uh, i see your point yeah thank you for that maybe um, yeah. thank you so i have a question having um the work with um companies that kind of make innovation their growth strategy. And I think this was very elegant. Have you seen um, examples where the ideas from the bottom, so kind of surprise the top management, maybe a little bit in a similar spirit as some of the other questions, because often the issue in these sort of mature companies, in my experience, is that there isn't the sort of ambition enough and because it's kind of reduced top down then it's sort of um in a way uh, uh split in ways that doesn't allow radical growth innovation or like for instance in some cases the people in company do have very very good innovation ideas but they don't sort of fit the strategy and this discussion between how do we get this radical idea that might offer a source of growth fit in our strategy on the top is often missing. So I'm kind of wondering, because it takes sort of top-down approach, and I understand it's maybe because of the military approach here, but, but have you seen within this context that the bottom uh, up can actually surprise the top and that they would, uh, how might they open up for these radical innovation opportunities, which are exactly the ones missing because there is no growth, and that's sort yeah, of the yeah. problem. Um, yeah, DTU with the with the cell program, uh, I would say that some of these projects that are actually brought here happen to be um, projects also where the organization doesn't really know what to do with it. It doesn't exactly sit in the core area. So how do we bring this to life? How do we build this up? How do we set this, give this an organizational structure that it, it can still work? So that, that is one of, the, um, one of the cases. And then I would also say the, the, the broader approach of emerging strategy. Strategy emerges as much as it is deliberate. And talking about innovation, if we go back, and this is an old example, but it's, uh, it's a striking example. When uh, Dell built up their, their, their business in late 1980s, early 1990s, they had this very deliberate strategy of uh, selling only B2B. Michael Dell had even asked consultants, should I not expand my market and uh, bring more growth in by uh, selling to private customers? And uh, the consultants told him, no, 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 you're going to destroy your margins if, if you do that. Don't, don't do this. Stick to what, what you're doing well. And the early 1990s, people, private people, started to call up Dell salespeople, saying, hey, I know you guys don't really sell to people like me, but I, I have a Dell at work, and, and I really like it. It's fantastic value for money. And can I have one at home for my son, my daughter, my family? And they're talking about salespeople. And the phone looking left and right. Somebody's missing. Of course you can. And this story did not happen once, not hundreds. It happened thousands of times. Dell had a six billion non-declared customer business in 1996 when suddenly you could read in the financial news uh, Dell company announces its um, entrance into the uh, B2C business. When it was officially announced it had already been building up for years, not declared, not encouraged by the top, sort of tolerated once when they saw it. So that, that is one of the um, 
greatest examples of this yes. sort of, uh, of innovation. Intel did something yeah. similar, but yeah. Uh, yeah, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. Just uh, deliberation on the fact that in this case, it's a company management that is probably united around a turnaround, a crisis. In the military, it would typically be a mission. If you don't do this, you actually die. So it's it's um, the question is whether this is what is the limitations of using military and sports as models for businesses because there are many more rules in sports and military. There are probably much more, um, uh, much much less um, ambiguity in who really wants what. Um, whereas uh, a real company, mm -hmm. a company is much more in, infested with politics <coughs> and and uh, mm -hmm. uh, in case um, a lot of information floating around where it's it's not direct directed from the top, or maybe <coughs> even at the top there are people who have different different objectives. Yeah. So where do you see the limitations of? Of yeah, um, I think that's precisely what what you said is precisely the reason why in, in the military it is um, in deployed only in in, in in elite units commandos that do not need a hierarchy of objectives. They get one or two objectives, and at the same time they need to have the freedom to to work it out. So I can see this transpose very well in into the area of new businesses of, of startups where there just isn't too much um, clarity. You need people who take the freedom and experiment with something. Then beyond that, and I'm not sure whether you were alluding to that, there's of course also the, the, the big ethical question, why do we always or why do we look uh, for, to the military for uh, concepts and leadership and, and strategy? I think this is what we, we've been doing for, for, for 2,000 years since the, in the art of war. And um, it is not because the concept is, is born in a military or in a war environment that this is the fault of the concept. I still think that there can be lots to be learned from it. The strategy was first discussed or explored in a military context. It just reflects the necessities of that time in, in China 2,400 years ago, which was an extremely uh, war-driven or war-ridden society. So that was number one priority for a public leader. And that's why then it happened to be in the military first rather than in organizations where essentially you did not read the word strategy or business strategy before perhaps 1958, 1959, or 1960. Yeah, you mentioned that uh, in the beginning that uh, this approach uh, was used by NATO in Afghanistan, uh, uh, and it failed. So why did you choose then this concept? The pro no, I, I said, uh, sorry if I did not make myself clear. I, I said precisely that... Um, NATO or the way how NATO worked or how the Afghan operation worked is the exact opposite of, 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 of this. Of okay, all right, thanks. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's because that, that was a whole a bonfire of, uh, of unclarity and lack of objectives and lack of, um, of, of responsibilities. I think we have two more and then we might want to go for a break before everything gets caught, yeah. I just wanted to say that th this model of analysis of yeah. causes and consequences is not just used in uh, sports or in military. Yeah. It's been used at the UN Absolutely. Uh, since the, the last 20 years as, as a model for creating country programs. So when we would, for example, design a new country program for Tanzania, of course there would be some overarching goals that you would achieve to lower, for example, the uh, child mortality or um, uh, maternal mortality or whatever overarching goals but then you would make the analysis all the way up and all the way down again to make sure that all the activities you would have in the country program would of course contribute to lowering maternal mortality or, yeah. so it's very much yeah. the same thinking it's an, an analytical model that you of course use in order for all staff members to be aligned with What's the overall, the overarching? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Well, thank you for the contribution. One more, and I think then we have to stop. I understand.
understand the, the structure here. The, the thing that the newer generations of creative working with the product creation and innovation, they want to seek organizations that have visions, goals, and uh, ambitions on, on behalf of humanity and uh, the universe. Uh, let's say, uh, call it that. How does that work uh, with the structure that is fairly rational, it's understandable, you need to do some things and you work from CEO level down and build the, the structures. How, how does a vision-driven organization, maybe this is a bit too big question as the last question before the sandwiches, the vision-driven organization that uh, can, can uh, spark uh, uh, dreams uh, within the organization and the rational and goal-oriented uh, organization and uh, execution organization like this. In just a, a few words on that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I think um, that there, there is no contradiction. There's precisely a vision-driven organization where you have easy clarity about the big purpose. What do we actually want to achieve? So then we might need less hierarchy also in terms of, of intermediate goals and objectives because the way how what I am doing at my level, how this links to the overall purpose might be much clearer. And then I think specifically in this sort of purpose-driven or vision-driven organizations where, where young people, the new generations are gravitating towards, they would want or they would appreciate the freedom of action that a framework such as Mission Command um, actually gives them because only the boundaries are set and, and many of them will still challenge even those boundaries but they would find more space to bring themselves in and then to develop themselves than in the traditional organization and while you were trying busy trying to work out your hierarchies I had a quick chat with, uh, with Matt and uh, we discussed the, the um, sort of parallels that we saw between uh, holacracy and holocratic structures and the freedom that, that they offer <laughs> and what is um, offered in this framework Right, I think that's all for me. Thanks a lot for, for your engagement.